Good afternoon again. I'm happy to talk to you about honeybees. Um, that's what I, I spend a lot of time studying um, and looking at, and we look at that nationally. And so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about honeybee losses, particularly in Maryland, and look at some of the particular challenges we're recognizing in Maryland um, for honeybee health. And then also just sort of end with some take home messages perhaps for you um, with, with what you guys do in terms of cropping. So we're here because honeybee colonies have been dying and they've been dying at pretty high rates. I mean, I was one of the first people who, who helped identify colony collapse disorder now 12 years ago. And so what that did, although we don't see colony collapse disorder anymore, is what it did was it made us start to look and start to look at how colonies were dying. And so what we've done is we've monitored losses ever since. And I want to explain this graph a little bit. We started in 2006 and 2007, and we just looked at overwintering losses, which is this yellow line. And that we consider that six month period between October and April. And so what you can see right away is that we were losing 30, more than 30% of our colonies over the winter. We also asked beekeepers, well, what level of loss would you have expected? And this was really quite astonishing because then and ever since, beekeepers have been saying that they expect an average loss of about 15 to 20 percent over the winter, which is an incredible number if you think about it. Like, how, how happy would you guys be if you lost only 20 percent of your crop this year, you know? You wouldn't be jumping up in joy. But beekeepers tend to have accepted this high rate of loss. And in part that's because beekeepers have the unique ability that if you have a dead colony, you can go to a live colony, split it in half, put it on your dead colony, buy a queen, comes in the mail, and you've made two colonies. So you're able to replace your losses fairly quickly. You can't do that if you have cows, right? Like you, if you lose 20% of your cows, you can't go split them in half. And so this is why I think that this problem was probably building for years. It's just we weren't looking. And so we have been looking. You'll also notice that we didn't have an annual loss rate earlier on. And that was because, so, so what you'll see is that we only started when we got funding to start looking at annual losses. And the reason we didn't look at annual losses before is because the summer is when bees have it in heaven, right? You got all this nectar coming in, you have all this honey coming in, you've got all this pollen coming in. So you expect things to be pretty good for bees. And so you're not expecting high rates of loss. Sorry. So what you have is, is, is these rates of loss in the summer. And you can see when we started, the losses were pretty low in the summer, just like we expected and the loss being the difference between the yellow and the orange line. But back in 2013, something changed. And we started losing as many colonies in the summer as we did in the winter, or even more. And so now we're at a time that the beekeepers across the country are experiencing nearly a constant rate of loss all year round. And that is an important change, and it's not a change that we fully understand. Although I think I'll try to highlight what I think might be driving it, particularly in this region. If we look at Maryland itself, Maryland is very distinct in, the, in a lot of the states in the fact that the average loss is the blue bar. So that's the national average loss. And you can see that Maryland in most years lose many more colonies than the rest of the country. And this is in part because we have to consider the composition of the average Maryland beekeeper. 95% of the beekeepers in the country are small-scale beekeepers, less than 50 colonies. These beekeepers consistently lose many more colonies than commercial beekeepers. Commercial beekeepers, there's very few of them, about 2% of the country's beekeepers have more than 500 colonies, and they manage 95% of the colonies. So it's a very concentrated issue. But in Maryland, by far, most of the colonies are operated by small-scale beekeepers. And small-scale beekeepers consistently lose more colonies than large-scale beekeepers. And I'll explain that a little bit more as well. Now, one of the things that we struggle with in this why are bees dying is because a lot of people have very strong opinions. And with the bee issue, I think it really caught a lot of people, it caught, it caught their imagination, right? We all know that there is something wrong if the bees are dying. Like, I mean, that, that can't be good, right? Like, there's just something we're connected to these bees, and we know. And so it, it resulted in a lot of public 
ideas and very strong opinions about what is causing these losses. And, and, and the fact is, is that <coughs> the drivers of these losses are complicated. And it's not just one single answer. And so I'm reminded of this great Baltimore critic who once said, for every complex problem there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And I think that is a very, very true for the B problem. There are lots of things going on and those things are different depending where you are in the country and the type of operation you have. But what I want to do is sort of highlight what I think are the major problems facing Maryland beekeepers. So of course there's a lot of challenges to bees. Um, we have these parasites and pathogens that can attack them. Um, we have pesticides, both the beekeeper applying pesticides to colonies to control the mites or pesticides that farmers are applying and the bees are bringing back. And I want to touch on, I, I'm sort of dreading to touch on the fungicide issue at the end of this talk, but I'll touch on that. Um, poor nutrition, a really important thing. A lot of the landscapes have changed. Before there was a lot of um, um, crop, like there, there were row crops with wildflowers in it for bees. Uh, out in the, in, the, in the Midwest particularly, there was a lot of fallow fields that now have been plowed under in, in corn and soybean. And so poor nutrition also plays a role. There's a lot less forage available for bees. And so we have a bunch of different causes. When we ask Maryland beekeepers to say, what do you think is causing your colony losses? Backyard beekeepers, who are the largest group of respondents to this, because that's the most beekeepers in Maryland, list starvation, weak in the fall, and poor wintering conditions as the three top drivers of loss. Those are not drivers of loss. Those are management practices that have not been applied properly. I've kept bees in northern Canada, so I know that you can keep bees alive. They don't starve and you can keep them good if you have the good colonies. And so we have to work with backyard beekeepers in order to get them to get their colonies in the fall to a state that's going to take them over the winter. And so I think that there is a lot of just basic practice that needs to be changed. You'll notice that for the sideline and commercial beekeepers, they begin to list Varroa mite as the most important driver. And I will argue in a second that in fact Varroa mite are, and they're a particular problem in Maryland. So I, wanna, I, I speculate that there are three major drivers of loss. We have the Varroa mite, which passes on viruses and make that makes it complicated. We have pesticides, both the farmer applied pesticide and the pesticide beekeepers are applying. And then we have poor nutrition, and that is represented here because this is, is, is a pollen that the bees have brought back to the colony. They bring it back on their back legs, of course, and they add enzymes and yeast, and this is actually bee bread. So they've got this fermenting pollen that is their only source of protein. So bees are true vegetarian in the fact that their only source of protein is this pollen. So Varroa mite, these are really large mites. Um, if we were a bee, it would be like a baby sitting on us, sucking us, sucking off our juices, right? And so these are really bad. They're also bad in the fact that when they bite, they spit up viruses in the bee, and these viruses get transmitted. There's a very good argument that mites don't kill your colonies. It's the viruses they transmit that kill your colonies, but we don't have a way of controlling those viruses, so we only have the mites to control. It's sort of like, you know, West Nile virus, right? You don't die from a mosquito bite, you die from a mosquito bite if it has West Nile virus or malaria or something. And so it's the same thing. These mites are vectoring these viruses. <coughs> What's important to realize about the life history of this mite is that it spends most of its time under the capping in the brood. So bees are like caterpillars and butterflies, right? You have an egg, a larva, a pupa, and an adult. Except they do their egg stage, larva stage, and pupal stage under a wax cap, or in a cat wax cell. And so a larva, the egg hatches, the larva is fed by workers, and then that mite will sit on a nurse bee and come, and she'll smell that mite, and that, that mite will jump off the nurse bee, smell the larva, and if the larva is the right age, it will hide underneath that larva, until the larva pupates. And when it pupates, the bees will put a wax capping over top that larva and the pupa develops. It's under that capping that the mite reproduces. It also means that in this time period when they're under the capping, you cannot kill these mites because they're protected by any contact or any fumigant. 
So it's really hard to control these mites because you can only control the mites that are on adult bees outside. And in fact, for every mite, or every two mites that you find on an adult bee, you'll find eight under the capping. So a majority of the mites are hiding away from any application we can use to control mites. So controlling mites is difficult in and of itself because of the life history of this mite. There's a lot more I can say here, but I think for this audience, I think that's enough. But I'm happy to talk about that some more. So really what we have is that we have this baby vampire. We've always been talking about this baby vampire <laughs> sucking up the blood of these bees and, and passing on viruses. It turns out that um, um, this, this, this picture is wrong. And I'll explain that here. I had a grad student, and he did some really cool work. And one of the things he did was, well, look, let's look for where the mites are. And so he picked up a whole bunch of adult mites, or bees, and looked for mites on them. And he found that 70% of the mites are on the left bottom side of the bee. And the left, it's, it's actually very biased to the left side. And so they're on the bottom bee. Now a lot of beekeepers, when they look up, they pick up a frame of bees, they say, oh, I don't see any mites. And that's why, because most of the mites are under the capping and they're underneath the, the bottom of the bee. So by the time you see mites on your bees, what you're doing is you're counting your dead colonies because those mite levels are so high they're going to die anyway. You cannot do that just by looking at a colony, a frame of bees. You actually have to do a sugar shake or something else to get these mites off. And I show this picture too because this next picture I have, you all have to be really impressed with. You have to all gasp and say, wow, okay? Because this is, this is like as a scientist, you always brag when you get the cover of a journal. Well, this, this next picture got the cover of the PNAS, which is like this real high, I never dreamed I'd get on it. So you ready? You have to be all real impressed, ready? Ta-da, wow. And so what you're doing is you're seeing a freeze shattered bee. And so what you do is you get a bee with a mite and you put it in liquid in propane and it freezes instantly. And then you get a razor blade and you hit it and you pray that it's going to crack at the right place. So this is the work of Sammy Ramsey who did this work and you should have heard him complain about his fingers because he had to hit these bees with razor blades 60 times before he got this picture. And so what you're seeing here is a cut through. It's actually upside down of course because most of the mites are underneath the bee, remember? And so what you're seeing is that mite, that mite getting underneath the sclerites of that bee. It's getting underneath there, and it's poking its head through this membrane, this soft membrane. And what's the tissue underneath there? It's fat. And so in fact, bees do not feed on the hemolymph or the blood of bees. Varroa, sorry, varroa don't feed on the blood of bees. They feed on the fat of bees. And this is really important <coughs> because fat is very different. I mean, wouldn't it be great we can just get a whole bunch of varroa mites on our belly, take care of that beer fat, you know, maybe there's a market. But we don't, but it's much more important for bees because bee fat is, does a lot of different things. One, it's where bees store their protein. So they need to store their protein there over winter. It's where they regulate immune response. It's how they detoxify pesticides. And what we now know is that these darn mites, they don't even have the decency to digest the fat in their own stomach. They actually just spit up this digestive juices and let it digest the bee alive, these fat alive, and then just slurp up the slurry afterwards. And so it's a really efficient mite causing a lot of damage to an organ that is really important. So the image we have then is it's not that they're, they're, they're vampires, but more like these baby werewolves <laughs> eating the fat. So one of the things that I do in my lab is we help run the National Honeybee Disease Survey funded by APHIS where we have samples collected randomly from about now 42 different states every year and we do a whole bunch of tests of viruses and mites and this then is a plot of mite levels across the country on average for you know until October 2018 so eight years of service so one thing you have to know is that we have always thought that at five mites per hundred which is right here five mites per hundred if you have reached five mites per hundred in your colonies even if you start to treat today your call you're gonna lose significant numbers of your colonies so that is you're gonna get damage we recommend that a treatment threshold of three mites per hundred 
And we've just changed that a little bit. So it's three mites per hundred. So right away you can see that the, on average there's a lot of colonies. If we combine all those dates and put that together, you can see starting in July, we're above an average of 35%. In fact, 35, sorry, an, aver an average of over three mites per hundred. So we're above the treatment threshold is starting in July and we're above the damage threshold starting in September on average across the country. In fact, only 35% of samples taken after August have mite levels we do not think are going to cause damage. And that's across the country. That's a really big problem. That becomes a very big problem in Maryland and northern states because bees are very different in the summer than they are in the winter. Summer bees only live 35 days. So if you take 10% of their lifespan away, they lose three days, you're going to lose a lot of honey, but the colonies have 50,000 bees, it doesn't matter. But if you're now asking a bee in the winter to live four or five months rather than 35 days, and you take 10% of its life away, that can cause serious problems in terms of overwintering. And so it's precisely in August and September that we say your mite levels need to be near zero in order for you to get through the winter. And you can see they're really high well beyond that. We also have evidence now that if you have mites at one mite per hundred in, in, in the earlier months, especially June and July, or no, sorry, May and June, if you have more than one mite per hundred going into your honey flow, you are nearly certainly going to have excessive mites at the end of the season and have mortality. So our, our recommendations now in terms of treatment thresholds are from January till, till, till May, you need to have about less than one mite per hundred on average in your colonies. And that's a big, big change. That's a big change especially if you think that 30 years ago when the mites first came here, our threshold was 20 mites per hundred. And that big drop has occurred because viruses have changed. And we should have expected it. If you have a virus that only gets transmitted from mother to daughter, as happened before Varroa mite, you expect that virus to be benign. You don't expect it to kill you, because if it did, you, it, the, the virus itself would die out, right? That makes sense, right? If your only option is to keep in the young, you don't want the mother to die, and you don't want the young to die. You have to get transmitted. But now we have a vector that's transferring it horizontally, from sister to sister. So now if you're a virus and you reproduce a lot of copies of yourself really, really quickly, sickening your host, you're just hoping that a mite's going to suck you up and pass you on. And the chances of getting sucked up are much higher if I'm really, vir really virulent. And so we've seen this shift in mites going from non-virulent, or viruses from non-virulent to extremely virulent strains. And so that's what we think is driving this decrease, is the presence of these viruses that the mites are spreading. One of those viruses, this deformed wing virus, this is obvious to see when the wings come out deformed. There's actually a variant out there right now that we're tracking, that if you have this variant, you cannot withstand one-tenth the mite levels you can if you have the other variant of this virus. So these viruses are really important drivers in understanding this story. But the mite story is complicated because people are involved as well. And people have different ideas of what is appropriate to treat. And so one of the projects we run is the Sentinel APRI program, where over 72 different beekeepers or beekeeper groups have eight colonies, and we send them sampling kits. And they sample those sampling kits, they send us those sampling kits once a month for six months straight over the course of the year. And then we get them a report back within two weeks to say what your disease levels were and all of that. And then you can compare. And so one, 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 this is exactly what we were hoping to see with beekeepers, right? We have this beekeeper, he's the dark green one, and here's a light green one, that's the national average. Every sample we've ever taken in that month of May, that's the average mite load. So this guy takes a sample, he's okay, he's okay, he doesn't do anything. August, okay, now he's worried, so he treats, and his mite levels are down, and he's very happy. This is exactly what we expect, this is exactly what we want, and this only happens 30% of the time. So what's happening else? Well, there's another group of beekeepers who are very adamant that they do not want to treat their colonies. They are fundamentally opposed to treating colonies for a variety of reasons, 
And some of those reasons are noble, there's no doubt. I mean, if I'm a small scale beekeeper, I have 10 colonies, I don't, I don't care if they all die, I'm not going to lose my house if all my colonies die. So I'm just going to let live, let live, let's just let evolution do its thing, let's select from survivors. So I'm not going to treat and I'm just going to let these colonies do whatever they want. Am I looking at that time right? No. Is, it, is that right? It is? Wow, I'm going too slow. So what they do is they're figuring, I'm just going to, I'm going to let all the colonies die and if one survives, I've got a resistant stock of bees and I'll save the world. And who doesn't want to save the world, right? Like that's a pretty noble fact. So these guys don't treat and their mite levels go through the roof. The one thing that these beekeepers I think are neglecting to realize is that by not treating, it's not like those colonies die and the mites stay in those colonies. Those bees explode and those mites explode and transfer over the landscape. We used to talk about them as varroa bombs, but then that's not so funny anymore. So we talk about them as wet dogs. We have these wet dogs where this colony collapses and it spreads this spittle of spit and wetness of mites across the landscape. Um, and we have evidence of that because look at here. We have this person here. He was really, she was actually really concerned in July about the mite level, so she treated and then if she wasn't part of the program, she would never have checked again because she thought, oh, my mite levels are great. They're really, really low. But look at them. They jumped through the roof. You can't explain that jump unless there's mites coming in. I had a real hard time believing this, and so we did an experiment where we had a colony collapsing in the middle of that circle, and we colored every bee in that colony blue. And we came back two days later, and we inspected 100 colonies within three kilometers, or about a mile and a half, two miles, around that apiary and we found blue bees in every single apiary but one within three kilometers. So this is really this really big wet dog blowing up across the landscape spreading mites. And so this is why one of our biggest messages in Maryland is you have to treat your mites. Some of the biggest proponents that this is pesticides are ones who do not treat for mites because they say I don't see any mites, I don't have any mites. But it's clear that if you don't have mites, you're going to get them because of these invasions. We do the, also this mite check thing here, and I'll just say that in August we do this emergency mitothon, and Maryland is particularly red, which is dangerous for the high levels of mites we have. Other issues, of course, poor nutrition. We've had a real big change in land use across the country, and in the Midwest especially, where there was a lot of CRP land, the price of corn and soybean took over and has replaced a lot of that. Pesticides too are a problem. If we look at pesticides, what we find across the country, only 20% of samples have no pesticides at all. 80% of samples from hives have at least one pesticide. However, it's not the, do it's not the dose, it's, the, it's, not the quant it's not if it's there or not, it's the dose that kills you, right? So in fact, through some calculations, only 6% of samples have levels of pesticides we're concerned about. Maryland tends to be particularly clean. I will say that we've been monitoring pesticide levels across the country or across the state and Maryland is very amazing because a lot of places are clean, clean, clean and then at one sampling period pesticides will go through the roof. I will caution that one of the things that we are very concerned about are fungicide sprays during bloom. Fungicides are considered safe to bees because bees can swim, adult bees can swim through, through, through fungicides and look perfectly healthy afterwards. We are growingly concerned that the exposure to pesticides, especially corthalonil and some of these other pesticides, are weakening the immune system and causing colonies to die later on. And we are certainly seeing a steady increase in the amount of pesticides, of uh, fungicides we're seeing in spray. So with that, I think I'm done. And um, have, there's a lot of information at the Be Informed website if you want to go over there. I'm also at the University of Maryland. Thank you all very much. Do we have time for questions or are we going yeah, done? Oh. Anybody have any questions? Where, where did the mite originally come from? Yeah, so the mite is a, is a mite that evolved on the Asian honeybee, which is a different honeybee, and it, that doesn't produce as much honey. So they brought the European honeybee to Asia and it jumped hosts, and that's why it's, it's new. For a long time, people have uh, touted the efficacy of doing splits, something to create a brood break to minimize uh, your mite load, but with this new research about them yes. being more interested in the, the fat body of adults, is there an issue with creating a brood break that will... Oh, no, 
I, I absolutely think that, that, that a small scale beekeeper in, in Maryland has to do splits as part of their, their management technique. So certainly those cultural techniques to keep mite levels from growing as fast, but you also need to have an application that knocks them down or something. You can't just let them die. I mean, it's sort of ridiculous if you think about it, because if they were mammals, if they had eyes, like if they were dogs, we wouldn't think that it was appropriate to let them all die from mange and hope one is going to survive. I think it's just because they're bees and we think, oh, they don't look as pretty, that we think it's okay to just let them die. Well, you could. I mean, that would be just, uh, there's a lot other, la that, that would be less labor intensive that could get your mites down. But you're talking, you're talking 20,000 cappings you'd have to uncap, right? So I don't know that that's practical. There are some products that can penetrate the capping. I think there are other ways, if you're willing to invest that much, there are other ways you can do it. It's just a lot, of, especially the big guys want something quick and easy. All right, thank you very much. Sorry for taking your time. Yeah.